Hello, my name is Carl Lloyd Hauser. I am the senior pastor of Grace Community Church, and I am so excited that you are with us on this podcast. We also want you to get connected in a church family. If you don't have a local church, check us out at gracemontrose.org. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to grow and connect with God. But we pray that these next 25, 30 minutes that you spend with us are powerful, that God meets you and speaks to you because He loves you so much. So we're in this Greater Things uh, series, and a greater thing happened last week. We had 65 people get baptized. Wasn't that amazing? It was like a baptism a thon, just kept going and going. If you were at the 11, sir, 11 o'clock service, it just kept going and going, didn't it? it was, that was pretty neat as that was going. So um, in this Greater Things series, I wanted to take you to a passage uh, that fits with it. It's uh, Jesus speaking in uh, Mark. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Mark 16. And these uh, powerful words and challenging words at the end of Jesus' ministry, Mark sixteen seventeen. And Jesus tells us this, and these signs will accompany, now I want you to catch this, those who believe. doesn't say it will accompany just the apostles, but it will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Now, there's some that believe that that passage was just for the church at the very beginning when it started. That's called a cessationist. I am not one of those people. Uh, I believe that uh, Jesus has given us the same Holy Spirit that he gave to the apostles. And that um, if you're going to say that God stopped doing miracles uh, in uh, when the church uh, got established, then, then what you're telling me is that there, he hasn't done a single miracle. Uh, he hasn't healed anyone. He hasn't seen, we haven't seen any of these things in the whole world for the last 2,000 years. And I just think that that's just ridiculous. It's impossible. I mean, I've seen miracles in my own life. I know that God is moving and that he gives us these signs. So yes, we saw those things literally happen with the apostles, but I think we can see them literally happen with our lives too. And I wanted to show you a testimony from our dear friend and pastor, uh, Ken, our executive pastor here. And uh, he wants to tell you a little bit about a time where God established his understanding of healing. Go ahead and play that video, please. Hello, my name is Ken. I'm the executive pastor here on staff at Grace Community. just want to take an opportunity to share uh, about a miracle that took place in my life back in 1971 when I was in college. I was playing softball and was in the outfield and the ball was hit to me. The grass was a little slippery and my feet went out from under me and when I caught myself, I broke my arm right here, both bones. And so I was taken to the hospital. They took x-rays. They they helped me put uh, the cast on and uh, then sent me home. Uh, The interesting thing about it is, is I worked at the hospital and that was part of my job was putting cast on people and taking cast off. And so I knew what I was in for, and it was going to be six weeks of uh, healing and et cetera that's going to have to take place. So after about two weeks, uh, I was working in the hospital, and I was pushing wheelchairs with my left hand, and it was really getting awkward, and this whole thing was clumsy, and I couldn't do my job, and it was affecting my schoolwork. You know how it is with a broken bone. So I was in my room by myself, and I just said, Lord, I just really need you to touch my arm and just heal me. And it was like instantly I was submerged in a, in a warm pool is what it felt like. And it was so soothing. And I realized at that moment that God had touched my arm. So I went back down on the ball field where the guys were practicing. And in front of them, I took the cast off, picked up a bat, and hit the ball. And then from there, I went to my car because I was excited. And I went back to the hospital, found the doctor who had put the cast on me, and taken the x-rays, and said, look at this. And so I started moving my hand all around. And he was absolutely amazed as I was. So guess what? Well, let's take an x-ray. And we did, and it was perfectly healed. Uh, it's one of those moments that solidifies you about certain things. And uh, I believe at a young age, it was solidified within my heart that God heals and the miracles still take place. Even though I don't see miracles the way I'd like to see them today, uh, I know that they take place because I have experienced that very thing. And my prayer is that God would continue to do miracles in our hearts and lives 
and that we would have faith and belief that that still continues to this day. Yeah, so I love that story, and I think that I could probably pull up many of you right now. I mean, there are many of you who could testify, like, wow, God did this amazing miracle right here in my midst. And I, I want to show you uh, two things this week, and there's two things as I was praying about these greater things that God does, two things about the miraculous, the supernatural of God's intervention in our natural world. And, and two things I want you to get is, first of all, that, that the miraculous, the supernatural, is prevalent and it's possible. It's prevalent, and it's possible, okay? So I want to take you to uh, an amazing miracle, and as I'm going to talk about this prevalence first. So if you have your Bible, uh, now go to Esther. So we're going to spend a pretty good chunk in Esther right now, and here's some amazing miracles, and we're going to start actually with the problem. Now the problem starts with a man named Haman, and Haman is an Amalekite, and the Amalekites and the Jews have been at it for hundreds of years at this point. Israel is in captivity. Haman is uh, one of the kind of the main guys up there underneath the king. He's a high official, and he actually has put this thing together where uh, when he comes into the room, you have to bow before him. And then Mordecai, who's a Jew, uh, he's not into that. And he won't bow whenever uh, Haman comes into the room. And so here's the problem, okay? It starts in Esther 3, verse 3. And it says, Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Now we don't know if it's because of the grudge that they have between them. We don't know if it's just because, um, you know, I'm not bound to anyone, or if it's the second commandment, that I'm not going to bow to anyone about God. We don't know what his motives are, but he won't do it. And day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether he, whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had been told he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, through the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So we're going to, it's genocide is what he decided is going to happen, right? So there's the problem. Okay, he's going to destroy all of Israel. Now I want to look at the miracle. So let's go over to Esther and we're going to go to to 1, chapter 1 here and look at verse 10. Okay, and so this is how it starts. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, you could read their names, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious, and he burned with anger. Now, is that the miracle? Well, I want to tell you, actually, yeah. It is. That actually, that, that, that is a miracle. But there's more. Go down to verse 19. And so she won't dance. She won't do what he wants them to do. So then this is their idea in verse 19. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persian media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti, that's the queen, is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The kings and his nobles were pleased with this advice. Yeah, right. So the king did as Mukum proposed. So now we got this sexist plan that they got. And now is this sexist plan the miracle? Well, yeah. Actually, it is. And and then here, let's go a little bit further here. Go into verse uh, chapter 2, verse 2. And it says, So then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let a search be made, for beautiful young virgins for the king. Okay, so that's what they decided to do. Is this beauty pageant, is, is that the miracle? Well, yeah, actually it is. And, and then now let's go down to seven. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah. So remember Mordecai? So he has a cousin whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. The girl was also known as Esther and was lovely in form and feature. And Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. And when the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Now, is that the miracle? Well, actually, yeah, it is. Okay, and now let's go over to uh, 17 uh, of that verse. Now, the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any other virgins. 
So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, and there's banquets all over this book, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the province and distributed gifts with royal liberty. So is that the miracle? Well, yeah, it is. And here, here's the thing. If you know the rest of the story, you know that Esther comes before the king, right? And we actually have extra biblical sources, sources outside of the Bible that, that verified that if you approached a Persian king at that time without being invited and he didn't uh, welcome you in, that you were executed. That's how it worked. So it's not just from this that, that we know that that takes place. So she approaches the king and terrified and the king lets her come forward. She tells him about the whole plot and God saves the people. Now here's something I, I want you to, to understand here. Do, do you remember the problem? That was in chapter 3, right? Do you remember the solution? When did that come? Chapter 1 and chapter 2. Did you understand that the miracle came before there was even a problem? Isn't that amazing? That God was orchestrating the solution before the people even knew they had a problem? The deliverance was established before the destruction was even conceived? Isn't that amazing? And see, God's, listen, God's miracles for your future are happening in your present. Isn't that cool? That he's setting up your miracles right now. You know, it reminds me uh, that uh, the past, the present, and the future, they all uh, walked into my office one day, and uh, it was tense. All right. They didn't like that one, huh? Okay, that's some good stuff. Now, the other thing that I want you to understand here is that this book, the book of Esther, it is the only book in the entire Bible that doesn't mention God once. Never says the word God. We don't hear anything about him. It, it actually doesn't have the word prayer in it. It talks about fasting, but you never see prayer. It's like the book, it's like, where is God in Esther? And I submit to you that actually that is the whole point of the book. I want you to understand that that's actually very, very intentional. And the reason that it doesn't overtly talk about God is because what the reader wants you to see is that God is always working in the background. This is the point. I think the point of the book of Esther is people, followers of God, be diligent to see God when you can't see God. That's what Esther proves. That's what shows us. I mean, God is orchestrating these things and moving. And I want you to understand that God's miracles are so prevalent. His hand, his work, the things that he's doing. Now, the people say Einstein said this, and I couldn't find it uh, from Einstein, but it's a really good quote. And if he said it, that makes it even better. But, but there's two ways to live. The, the people can live like everything is a miracle or like nothing is a miracle, right? You know, I, I was talking about this very idea with my D group. I meet with a few guys every week, and, and I, I just was saying, isn't oh, amazing how God is just quietly working in the background. And as soon as I said that, you know what happened? Every single guy has got a story. Go on, this is what happened to me, and this is what happened to me, and this is what happened to me. One of the guys, he, he said, you know, when I was a single dad, we had nothing. And, and I was like trying to find food anywhere I could, and I, could, I couldn't pay any of my bills, and I was in this little shack. And one of my friends from the service came and visited me, and, and I don't even know why he came over. Neither of us were Christians. And, and or weren't walking with God at that time. And, and the guy came and, and he took five, he put a bag on my, my counter and then he left and I opened the bag and it had $5,000 sitting in it. Was that God? Come on. And then another guy, he says, oh, you know what? That reminds me of a story. And he, he said, I was roughnecking out near Rifle and I got, I got laid off and I didn't have a job and I wanted to marry my fiance who's his wife now. And then also my mom wanted to go back and visit relatives in Mexico and couldn't afford it. And so my brother had footed the money for her to do that. And he said, we just had nothing. And so then I got invited uh, from, a, I think, a relative to go play bingo up in Grand Junction. And they just so happened at, at this bingo uh, to have this massive prize. It was a $15,000 prize. And he said, I went up there and I won it. Isn't that amazing? And he was able to pay for his mom to go to Mexico. He was able to pay for his wedding. He was able to keep going forward. You know, and I know some of us would be like, well, bingo's of the devil. <laughs> right? That's gambling. I don't know. It sounds like God to me. It sounds like God was working right there. 
You know, and we have these stories. I know that we have. I mean, this weekend, there's 1,400 different stories of people. You can tell me. I know all of us. You could come up here and testify. Look at how God came through. You know what I'm seeing God do right now? Is this whole idea of providing before we even know we need it. He was doing that for this church. A, you know, so I'm going to talk next week just a little bit during our service about our youth building expansion. And so now, before we have even asked a single person for a dime, so God had just been moving. So that property that we bought over here to uh, the north, right? Uh, you guys gave an extra $180,000 over what we needed. And so our intention, and, and you have a voice in this, if you gave and you don't want this to happen, is to take that extra money and put it towards the youth building as, as, we, uh, as we develop that. So let me know if, you're, if you don't want your part to go to that. But that's what we're going to do. And then, um, then a guy, at the end of, towards the end of the year, uh, he sold his business and he moved. And he said, you know, God told me to tithe off the business. And he gave us a, just, he said, here's $100,000 off the business that I sold. And then at the end of December, we had uh, just a crazy financial month in a good way. And we had another $100,000 that we could put to, a side, to the side. So I, w- I want to explain something to you. Before we have even asked for a penny, we have $400,000 sitting there ready for the building. Look at God move. I mean, he's, you see, he, your future miracles, he's working on your future miracles right now. Isn't it amazing? And I know you have those stories. And see, many people, I, I think the common idea is, well, I'll believe it when I see it. But the truth is for us, listen, I, I see it because I believe it. Our eyes are open. And well, what a narrow view. What, what, I, but just sad if you believe in chance and luck. If that's, I mean, you're missing so much. You're missing this amazing mosaic and puzzle that God is just working and putting together and how he's orchestrating these things. I mean, these things that are happening, like this beauty pageant, that's weird, right? And this call to make your wife dance in front of everybody, like, what? You know, I mean, these are not good things. But yet God is in the middle of that, working even in the bad things. Always working for you. Miracles are happening all the time. I want you to understand that it's taking place. So you see these, we call them maybe circumstantial miracles, right? But you see them, and guess what? They are still miracles. And they're happening, and you see them in the Bible. Like Joseph, for example. I mean, isn't it a crazy circumstance? But how lucky that, that when he's in prison, that this guy whose dream he interprets just happens to be the king's cupbearer. Wow, what, a, what an amazing circumstance, right? What a coincidence. Or how about... Uh, baby Moses, you know, his mom puts him in the reeds to protect him. And what, what, a, it's a, what a coincidence that the person who finds him is Pharaoh's daughter. Are you going to tell me that happened by chance? That's a miracle. Because then he comes in and he understands what it is to rule a country because he's going to have to rule a people and lead a people. He understands what it is to work with the court and he understands how it's all going to happen. I mean, and God puts him right there. Well, what an amazing coincidence that Nehemiah, he's all choked up and he's just like, he can't bear him to, to, to hold it in. And that just happens to be in front of King Artaxerxes, who says, well, now let me give you everything you need because you don't need to be crying. What a coincidence, right? These miracles are happening in your life all the time. So that's the prevalence. Guys, we, we've got to understand that God is working right now, right now for your future. But now I want to talk about the possibility and I guess maybe we would call them like the big miracles, right? Like healing. I was blind and now I see, right? Now, but I think the big miracles is actually the wrong thing because what's bigger? Well, is it bigger for someone to receive their sight or for Esther to, re- to protect a whole entire nation from genocide? Which one's bigger? I don't know. So maybe the right word would be immediate, right? And I, I want you to understand that those immediate miracles, like Ken was talking about, are possible, that God still does it. And so we're going to find this, So we're going to look at a place where it really wasn't happening very well. Let's go into Mark chapter 6 in verse 5. And talking about Jesus, it says, He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, I think it's kind of funny that they'd say, ah, you know, all Jesus did was heal a few sick people. You know, for us, that would be like full-on revival. But for Jesus, that's like a kind of a bad day, right? Okay? So just, I just healed a few people. 
But, but what happened there in Nazareth? Why isn't that, that this disappointing, you know, like it just wasn't happening at that place? And I, see, now there's this kind of idea that we have that I just want to dispel. And anybody play like a, video games at all? And, you know, you play those video games and you know, sometimes like to get like the nitro boost or the turbo power, you know, you got to push the button a bunch of times or you got to work something up and then finally you have that turbo power and you hit it and it's like, boom, you got the power that you need. See, there's some Christians that look at faith and miracles like that. Like, okay, if you just work up enough faith, work up enough faith, work up enough faith, okay, then, okay, now you gave God the power that he needs to, to, to do the healing. Wrong. God doesn't need any help. Okay, it's not that Jesus was like, man, if you guys would just have some faith, then I'd have a little bit more like turbo juice that I could help out and, and do some miracles here. That was not the problem. It was the attitude. It was the heart that these people were approaching him, him with. See, if we go up to verse 2, it says, when, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him, they were amazed at his teaching. And catch this, where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given to him? That he even does miracles. I mean, in, in, in the presence of miracles, look at the, their hearts. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And this is what I want you to see. And they took offense to him. They took offense at him. If your starting place is offense, if your starting place is unbelief, you wouldn't recognize a miracle if it bit you. Why would you give glory to God if you're already just sitting there with your arms crossed, angry at him? Jesus talks about this very thing in this uh, parable. He tells a story about a man, a rich man who goes to hell and uh, his servant, uh, Lazarus, or actually the guy who's out in front begging in front of his house, Lazarus, goes to heaven. And, and so in this parable, uh, the rich man, he, he's in torment. And this is what he says in uh, Luke 16, 27. So the rich man says to Father Abraham and Lazarus, he says, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. He's like, I don't want my family to come to this horrible place. Please, will you, you let Lazarus go back and warn him? And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Prophets, Let them listen to them. He's like, they, they've got everything they need. No, Father Abraham, the rich man said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then listen to this. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus raises, uh, coincidentally, a man named Lazarus from the dead. And what happens? They say, well, we better crucify him. And then Jesus himself rises from the dead. And what do they say? We got to keep this thing quiet. We got to tamp this thing down. And if you're going to come to God with unbelief, if you're going to come to God with your arms crossed, you're not going to see a miracle if it comes and just bites you. And so are we approaching Jesus with crossed arms and closed hearts or with open hands? You know, there's this uh, father, he comes, he says, Jesus, you got to help my son. And he, the son is demonized and he's uh, it's just all sorts of suffering. And, and, and the guy says to Jesus, he says, if you can. Those are amazing words. And Jesus, in, in 923, Mark 923, he just says, if I can. If I can, do you know who you're talking to? The one who created the universe and the stars? The one who knows how this body works and put it all together? If I can, who are you talking to? Oh, Lord, help our unbelief. Lord, give us faith. We need to be confident and believe that he can, that he will move, that miracles happen now. Oh, Lord, if I can. And the, and the next thing is we need to be confident, listen, that he hears us and he cares. He's moving all the time. You know, I was, uh, last night uh, before the service, I was talking to a, uh, one of our members in the bathroom and he, he is seriously sick. Um, and we've been praying for him every single week. And I just said, I said, hey, how's it going? And he's like, oh, you know, and, and he's, it's tough for him to move. And he said, uh, you know, we keep praying and keep praying. And he said, you know what? Whatever comes, I just want to bring glory to Jesus. Whatever God decides to do, I'm just going to glorify him. Because you know what? That guy's confident that God cares. 
That God is, God, God is confident that God is there even in the midst of that. And we need to be willing to embrace what God decides to do and what God is going to give us. And remember that God is for us. And that the most important thing, really, truly, the greatest thing is what he do, does right in here, isn't it? God, Listen, God still heals. But the greater thing is when he turns a heart. The greater thing is 65 people who just got baptized last week. The greater thing is the, the 80, 90 people who, who gave their lives to Jesus the week before. But there's another way to come at God. Look, look at this in Luke chapter 6. Verse 17, so we saw what they came, uh, how they came at God with their crossed arms in Nazareth. But look in verse uh, 17 of 6. In Luke it says, He went down with them, stood at a level place, and a large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people who tried to touch him, and the people all tried to touch him, because power is coming from him and healing them all. And the thing I wanted to show you is then the people tried to touch him. See, there's two ways to come to Jesus in healing and what he does is you could come like this or you could come like this. And if your starting place is seeking and earnestly chasing and going after God with all your mind, if you're just going to, oh, Lord, I, I just want to touch you. I just want to see it. Listen, you will see him in whatever he decides to do. And sometimes I'm praying this, and God does that. And he's got the right to do it. But if you seek him, you will find him. You know, it's kind of like the gift of tongues. I've heard people talking about the gift of tongues. And I believe that that's available to everyone right now. I believe all the gifts are. But, but, But I've heard people say, well, that's weird. Right? I understand that. And I've heard people say, and I don't want anything to do with that. Well, guess what? God's not going to force you. He's not going to make you. You know, and if you're not going to seek it, if you say, I don't want anything to do with that, you probably aren't going to experience it. It's a whole different thing to say, okay, God, if it's of you, I want it. Whatever you've got, I want. But I would, I would guess that one of you, every, every one of you have at least one miracle story. I mean, not just circumstance, but like where God just came in and immediate. I've got a, I've got a bunch of good ones in my life. Not as many as I would like to have, just like Ken would say. Sometimes I'm like, come on, Lord, do this one. And he doesn't do what I want him to do. See, but, but that's the thing. That, that, that's what drives me crazy when people are like, well, if you would just have the faith, if you would just work, if you would just do this or do that, it's like, wait a second. If I, I, I get to decide, I get to make God do things? You know, I pull these little toggles. If I do this thing right, then God comes through. I mean, who, who does the healing here? I remember I was uh, uh, starting off in my faith. I went on a mission trip in Romania. And uh, we were staying at this home, and they had this uh, little baby girl. And uh, this baby was just really sick and just throwing up all the time, wouldn't keep any food. And she was little, and they were worried, and it had been going on for multiple days. And they were actually starting to, to be concerned about her life. And, and they said, would you pray? And we're like, sure, we'll pray. And we laid our hands on this baby, and, and the baby didn't throw up ever again. Well, maybe someday, but not that time. For like the whole time we were there, the next five, six days, the baby was well. God healed the baby. And you know, I think God did that because he just wanted to establish something in me. One of the reasons I got to see that is God just wanted to say, see, I do this. I think God wants to establish some things in some of our lives here. Just show you, I'm here, I move, I do these things. And I'm here right now not to give you some sort of secret formula for a miracle. Listen, I'm here just to open up your heart again to the possibility. I'm here to to encourage you and ask you just to to see that they're all around you, to open your heart up to the prevalence. I mean, that's where I want to live. So here's an, so another miracle in my life. So uh, my shoulders are a mess. They, they've been a mess for a while. Both of them are. They're still not great. But um, I was, uh, my, my, I think it was my left shoulder was just absolutely frozen. I mean, I couldn't lift it like past like right about here. And it was, uh, it hurt every night. It was waking me up at night and it was just a pain. And so I went to the doctor and uh, he gave me a steroid shot and, you know, that didn't do anything. And I uh, did some physical therapy. That didn't do anything. And so it was just, it was not getting better. So finally, the doctor says, we're, we're going to have to cut on it. That's, I think, the only way we're going to get through this. 
And so there's this night, and some of you have heard this story before, but I, I was actually going through some pretty serious spiritual warfare, and I was just, I had these lies coming to my head and these struggles, and, and then God was speaking to me, and, and he would give me these encouragements and these truths. And I told him, I was like, Lord, these are nice truths, but I, I'm afraid that I'm just making it up. I'm afraid that I'm just telling myself what I want to hear right now. I don't, how can I know? How can I know that these things are really from you, that these promises are true? And right when I prayed it, Right when I prayed those words, my left shoulder went, and I was like, what? And I was like, what? I was like, what? And then I went down. I was like, Gina, check this out. She's like, oh, my gosh. And I went and I showed my doctor. He's like, oh, my gosh. What happened? I told him the story. God wanted to establish something in my life. You know, I was just like, Lord, I need you. I just need your grace right here. And I'm not saying we'll do this and God will do that. I'm just here to say that he's not done with miracles. That we need to approach him in faith and that his working hand is so prevalent. And I want to tell you that even those immediate, surprising, amazing miracles are still possible. That he's still working. You know, this miraculous intervention in the Bible, it comes at these times when God establishes things. You know, with the people of Israel, the plagues, in the Red Sea, Jesus is saying, I am establishing Israel as my people. And then the, the, the miracles come when Jesus' ministry is being established. He is the Son of God. He has the authority to forgive sins. And the miracles come to prove it. And the church is being launched. And there's these miracles saying, this is my church. I am establishing my church. And they come in times of need. And the widow of Zarephath, she, she's just like, she's going to die. And they come, and the prophet Elijah prays for her, and then all the oil is filled, and she has everything that she needs to pay all her debts to keep living. Or Samson, you know, just like this one last time when his eyes are blind, and he's chained, and he's against the pillars. He's like, okay, Lord, just one last time, do a miracle. He pushes the pillars, and defeats more Philistines in that moment than he had in his entire life. And God comes with miracles because he just loves you, and he's compassionate. I love the feeding of the 5,000. You know why? Because nobody was going to die. They would make it. But God has compassion. He says, any compassion on them. So he comes and provides and takes care of them. Fathers of Jesus, we've got to trust. We must trust his strategy. That whether he does the miracle immediately or he does it over time, or whether he touches the physical or he touches the heart, the question, the question is, will you give him glory in it? Will you walk in faith in the midst of it, whatever he decides? See, the most important part of the miraculous actually isn't what God does. It's how you come to him and how you respond in the middle of it. What you do with it. I want more miracles. Not because I want to show. Because I want God to get all the glory. I want you to see his power and his love. I'm praying for more. So how do you come towards Jesus and his work in your life? Do you come with offense like, why wouldn't he? Where was he in that time? Or do you come with hunger? Do you come with faith? He can, so I will ask. I know he'll move. I don't know how, but I know he will move, so I will seek. Are you going to come with him every day with trust? And sometimes, you know what, he doesn't heal. But you know what, sometimes he does. And will you trust him with the outcome? You trust that he's good in the middle of it. Will you continue on in faith regardless of how it goes? Will you continue to believe in miracles? I just want to pray right now. Lord, I, I ask God that you would establish some things right now. God, you would establish some things in our hearts. And God, there are many people, if you, if you need a miracle, just raise your hand right now. If you need a miracle in your life, God, there are many people here who need a miracle. And God, there, there's relational miracles. I, I pray, Father, for relational miracles that you'd bring healing right now, God, in Jesus' name, that you would open closed doors, that you would restore broken relationships. Lord, there are people that need physical miracles, God. And Lord, they've gotten bad reports so that the things just aren't getting better. In Jesus' name, Lord, re release healing, release miracles. We believe in miracles, Father. There are people that need miracles of provision and miracles of hope. 
miracles of circumstances where things just that doesn't look good for the future. Lord, just come in and rescue us. Work right now. I thank you. The miracle of our future, Lord, you are working right now in our present. God, release these miracles in our lives. And God, we do believe. Just help our unbelief. Help our unbelief, Lord, to look to you, to believe you, to trust you, God. You are the God of miracles. Release your miracles, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope that God spoke to you. We would love to follow up and care for you any way that we can. So come visit us at gracemontrose.org. Say hello. Let us know what we can do to help you grow in Him. God bless you.